Hey, it's Mike. Welcome to Intergalactic, the podcast about the greatest sci-fi movies and TV of all time. I'm here with my co-host, Clyde Haynes. What is up, Clyde Haynes? Hey, Mike. Glad to be here talking a little Stargate SG-1. Ooh, it's going to be fun, fun show. Yeah, we're back talking Stargate SG-1. Uh, this is our essential Stargate series where we cover some of the most essential episodes of Stargate. Uh, based on a list by our friends over at GateWorld.net. Today we're covering the sixth episode of Season 2, Thor's Chariot. Kind of a sequel to the episode Thor's Hammer from Season 1. An episode I really enjoyed. Um, Clyde, uh, I guess just to reorient uh, the listeners, I'm kind of an SG-1 newbie. Uh, I've watched... A lot of Atlantis, watched a lot of SGU, never really got into SG-1 because it just felt older and more boring and slow because it was the first Stargate series out there. You are an SG-1 old head. This is a rewatch pod for you. This is the first time watch for me. Um, Before I talk about Thor's Chariot, tell me... How about you tell me what you felt about this episode? Did you like it? Yeah. You know, it's always tough to do a rewatch because it's competing against the new you, the you are the, the, the person I am today versus the person I was then. Um, and I've watched a lot of sci-fi. I've read a lot more sci-fi than when I, than when I watched this. And it also has a certain nostalgia that's in my head about what it was that I watched. And so it's always in, in competition. So every time I turn on one of these episodes, I'm always worried that like, ah, oh, it's going to hold up to what's in my head. Right. And this is a big one. Like this is the, like, we, we get to meet Thor. Like this is a significant one for me. And what I was walking away from was this, I, I my opinion of the episode was just appreciation. Right. And what I mean was thought it was a good episode. We've, got some new characters. Um, but it was just like the writers sat together and they were like, you know what? Let's, let's fix some things we did that we probably shouldn't have done. And you and I have talked about this a number of times on the show, right? We've talked about the kind of the, the, the Thor episode where they go to Samaria for the first time and they break Thor's hammer, right? The mm-hmm. Thor's hammer episode. We, we, we've referenced that a few times, like, man, they just messing up stuff. And it's like the writer said, hey, let's revisit that and fix it. And so they did. And in that, we got this introduction of Thor. Samaria is now a safe place again. They've, they've fixed the hammer. Like, I overall, I dug this episode, and it was a great kind of, hey, we're going to start out at the SGC. We're going to go on our away mission. It's going to be episode. It's going to be the away mission of the week. And we're going to come back. And I'm like, yes, it's settling into its groove a little bit. So when I finished this, I was, I felt appreciation and pleased, right? When I nominated for an Emmy, maybe not, but I liked it. Like, this is kind of what I think you sign up for when, when you watch SG1, right? Like, this is, this is the floor, I would say. Like, this is the standard. You're going to get some episodes that blow you away, and you're like, oh, my goodness, that's amazing. This, to me, is like, this is the, the, the I don't want to say middle of the pack because that doesn't sound right, but this is like just the, the consistency that you, you hope for in a show like this. Yeah, I liked it, too. Um, before I dive into how much I liked it. This was written by Catherine Powers, Clyde. Mm -hmm. Catherine Powers, who apparently I'm looking at her IMDb. She wrote 15 SG-1 episodes. This is like her second or third Catherine Powers. Um, Listeners, of course, Catherine Powers wrote the terribly uh, horrible uh, racist uh, TNG episode, Code of Honor, back in the day. So it's wild that she got so much work after that. <laughs> but I, I mean, uh, I can't, I have here. to say I'm a little surprised. Yes. Uh, and and yeah. she also the, like, so not only did she write code of honor, which most people just absolutely hate. She mm-hmm. also wrote emancipation, which is a Stargate episode, Stargate SG one episode that most people would just absolutely hate. But I look at this and go, 
it just goes to show you that you can do some, you can make mistakes and you can come back from it. And so redemption, that's what this is. Yeah. You have a much more positive outlook on it than I do. Um, but despite this written by being, despite this being written by Catherine Powers, uh, I guess she learned a few lessons because uh, there's nothing uh, overtly uh, offensive in this episode. And I I really enjoyed it. I like the idea that the SG-1 team is is having to go back and clean up one of their messes. Uh, that this truly is, even though the episodes are pretty episodic, this truly is a serialized story where something we do in the middle of season one it's going to come back to haunt us sometime in season two. And we're going to have to go deal with it. Um, and that's cool. It's always good to know that there's a, a broader world or universe being built in a sci-fi show that you're watching, especially one that goes on for 10 years. Um, but I, I love that the show feels like there's more story to be told by going back to one of the, one of the different planets that they gated to, because the whole premise of the show is, a uh, new adventure, new world. We'll step to the Stargate every week and find a new world with a new adventure. But it makes it, it makes the stakes feel higher and it makes things feel more dramatic and more realistic. And it makes me care more about these people, these characters and the world. If sometimes they hear back from the worlds that they've been to and they have to go back and there's new stories told in the worlds we previously went to, like in this episode. And the story grows and builds and it becomes part of the the DNA of the show like it does in this episode, which is great. Um, and there's a couple of different things that happen in this episode that have, it seems, they seem to have pretty big ramifications for the rest of the series. Um, I want to talk about one of the more interesting ones, which is Carter being able to use the Gould technology. In the middle of the episode, we we find out that Kendra, who the team met on their first trek to Samaria back in season one, she has passed away. She was um she used to be the host of a Gould, right? And she was able to evade the Gould, get the get the worm out of her, but she still had lingering ghoul powers or some kind of connection to the ghoul. And she still had these um, these relics, these artifacts, or these weapons that the ghoul had that they gave to her. And now she's, she's dead um, because of the ghoul attack on this planet. But now Carter finds... Um, what does she find? She finds a, a, like a, a bracelet? What is it? So it's like a, it's almost like a glove, right? So it holds the fingertips. It's got a wrist. It goes around the wrist. And then in the center is uh, an energy weapon, right? So you can like burst out energy. And I think it also might do, we see, you know, uh, the Horus, uh, Heru, or uh, Gould kind of use it on, you know, the, Sumerian guy where he puts it over his head and like, have you ever, you know, what do you feel about pain? So I think it does something very similar to that. And it's also, there's a healing device. that looks like a stone with a cloth wrapped, wrapped around it. But those are the two things to your point, Mike, this is a, this is a big deal up until this point, you've got all this ghoul tech, but what we knew is that the, the, the Tari, the, you know, as humans couldn't use any of it. Right. Like the Jaffa couldn't use it. And what it comes down to is you have to have this Gould kind of, or this ex Gould in you. And so this whole world has opened up to Carter, which is fascinating. And it looks like they've taken this, this, this stuff back with them. So that does become a threat that we can pull on later on in the, in the, the series. So I love that she found the healing device. I don't know if she, does she use it in this episode? I think she doesn't, she, right? She hasn't been able to get it to work yet. So Right. Well, I hopefully down the line they will, because in terms of like storytelling, it seems using like a handheld healing device is a much better 
uh, and much better like uh, idea than putting somebody in the sarcophagus to heal them, right? That probably it, it, works better for TV. Especially because they keep blowing up the sarcophagus and they haven't actually tried to <laughs> steal one yet. So I'm like, what are you guys yeah. doing? Like, yeah. grab one of those things and send it to the Stargate. Like, hold on to it. Um, but yeah, the, like that was pretty cool. The other one of the other big things we got is the reveal of a new system lord. You mentioned him earlier, Harrow R. The yes. uh, the the son of uh, Hathor and Apophis, and two Ra. of the biggest assholes we've ever met. So the the son of Ra, Ra and and Hathor. Oh, it's Ra and Hathor. Okay. Mm-hmm. Son of Ra and Hathor. Oh man. So Ra, Ra yeah, so which means not only is he particularly nasty, but he's yeah. also really upset cuz Ra was the first god they killed right uh, in the movie. Right. And Apophis is his brother. So at this point, Hera Or is looking like you, you you've killed my father and my uncle. Um, and you tried to capture my mother. Yeah. When he, when he connects those dots, he's not going to be that thrilled about all that. I did think that even though like typically these ghoul system lords just seem kind of silly to me, they seem like one note, one dimensional villains, um, which I guess it's okay. Cause it contrasts very well with our heroes who have a lot going on or really, and are very colorful and interesting, you know, and have a lot to say. Which is cool. Um, but even though he was pretty one dimensional and was kind of like a gym bro, um, I did find him to be more of a threat or seem more threatening than Apophis ever really did. So if he's going to be the new big bad for this season, I'm down for that. So is he the new big bad or does he come back just a few times? Does Apophis come back? I'm asking for spoilers, I know. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not going to give you too much because I have to. I have to go back and remember. Uh, I think, like many of them, he's around for a little bit. Um, but I think the interesting thing about Stargate is, at this point in the series, there's there's not always just one big bad. Where mm-hmm. what we're introduced to is there are a bunch of system lords out there with v- varying agendas. And what you want to do is you want to explore as much as possible without accidentally stumbling upon one, because then you got to deal with one. And at this point, they have stumbled upon Harrower, and at some point he is going to, you know, want to want to deal with them in return. So the what gets us in trouble and gets the, the SG crew back to Samaria is the fact that they pretty much destroyed the planet's defenses back in season one. Uh, Samaria essentially had a, a anti-ghoul device set up in front of the gate. So any ghoul that tried to go through was instantly zapped away to this like underground um, prison that was called Thor's Hammer. and Or the whole device was called Thor's Hammer. And they were left there to die. And this happened to Teal'c when they first went to this this uh, planet back in season one. But DSG crew were able to rescue Teal. But to do so, they had to destroy Thor's hammer, leaving them defenseless. Now, I don't quite remember the end of that episode. I know they got away and everything was happy and good. But did anybody say, hey, maybe we should fix this for these guys? Or was it just like, let's just ignore that? <laughs> It, well, there's there was nothing that they could do, right? So they they mm-hmm. couldn't. It wasn't like they have the technology to fix it. It was more yeah. like, oh, I guess you know we had no choice, so we had to destroy it. It's you know we couldn't have just let Tilt die. And so I think what's interesting about this episode um, is that it it kind of looks back and it elevates some of their choices, right? So we see their first test is a test of courage. And, you know, Mm -hmm. it's Daniel Jackson putting his life on the line to save, um, you know, the Sumerian woman. And I think in that, it's almost saying, hey, you destroyed the device. Carowin, yeah. But you you destroyed the device, but you did it to save a friend, right? Like, you did it to save a friend. So it's almost like they were saying, like, we understand why you did it. And that was really noble. 
And in the end, it took nothing for Thor to replace Thor's hammer. And then yeah. like, and then, and then take up all of the, the kind of the Jaffa and the ghoul that were on the planet in a way that I had never seen this before, Mike. I mean, if that wasn't a prediction of Wraith tech, I don't know what yeah. it is. I mean, even the sound was like, yeah. and I was like, oh man. So that's where it came from. Interesting. That's what I thought of instantly. We're jumping to the end, but that was a huge flex when the, when the the Asgard ship just shows up and it's this huge ship and it just starts beaming motherfuckers out of there. And it's like, it let's just instantly beam all the bad guys off the planet. Uh, it was, and it was very Wraith. Yeah. It was like when the Wraith darts, you know, uh, beam up people and, and take them away and, and cool, cooling, right? That's what they called it. Uh, mm-hmm. that's yep. essentially what the Asgard were doing here. They were culling the planet of all the gold and they did it in such an efficient fashion. If I were the gold, I'd be like, okay, I'm turning a new leaf. I'm not fucking around. With these guys. If these guys are the space cops, I'm a good guy now. Like, fuck this. <laughs> because man, that is super powerful. It almost makes me think if the, if the Asgard are this powerful, isn't that a story problem? Like, Anytime something bad happens, let's just get the Asgard in here, right? Does, does that it become has the, a story problem, or are they? Are they? Yeah, no. It, it, so, so one of the things that they do with the Asgard is not to give too much spoilers away, but you're right. When you have a super like ally or a villain, it can easily be a story problem, and so you have to put things in place to prevent that, right? And one of the easiest things to do is you make them preoccupied so that you don't have access to them. And that's what we get. It's like they're far off away. They're involved in their own war. And so it's it's kind of like what you do with the Nox, right? The Nox are super powerful, but for whatever reason, you yeah. don't have access to them. I think what we're seeing with the Asgard is something similar. And, you know, you know a little bit about this because you know Atlantis, and you kind of know that there's some things that go on as, as we'll, you know, much later in the series. Basically, it's just like this. The Asgard has got their own stuff to deal with. This, the skirmishes between the Tauri and the Gua'uld is not what they're interested in. They've already kind of looked and like, can we meet them? And they're like, <laughs> oh, so cute. You're not quite ready yet. But maybe someday. Like, that's the way they they pat them on the head and send them back to the kids' table. And I think that's what it is. It's like, yes, they're powerful, but they're not super powerful because they're in a war with the gold that they haven't just went. So the gold must be able to do something to at least keep the Asgard somewhat in check. True. Yeah. I'm looking forward to finding out exactly what the gold's tactics are to keep the Asgard at bay. If, if they can just show up and zap their pyramids away, like in an instant, that's pretty powerful. Um, pretty powerful stuff. Yeah. What did you think of the reveal of Thor as a tiny little Roswell Gray in this episode when you first watched it back in the 90s or whenever. I loved it, right? The reason why <laughs> I cool. love it. I mean, he- here's the thing that I dig about Stargate. And I think for me, this is this is the basis of everything. Is rather than create a completely new mythology, right? So if you think about something like Star Trek, Right. Star Trek creates aliens and those aliens have their own completely unique and like history from scratch. Right. You take the Klingons, the Klingons, just, it's all new. It's all brand new. What they've done, what Stargate has done is said, we're going to take all of the mythology that we have and we're going to root it in something that is very, very close to the history and things that you know. So we've seen this in the form of like, you've got the Gould, which are kind of presented as the Egyptian, like this is where Egyptian mythology come from. And then you've got the Asgard, which is basically Norse mythology, right? Uh, not to spoil anything, but we'll see some like Mayan slash Aztec right in here so there's so they they basically said these things that we haven't been able to explain why have the egyptians created these gods right and ra and apophis and 
Hathor, like where did this come from? It comes from this. This is this is what that is. So to tie in the imagery that we have of what an alien looks like and go, the reason why you have that is because of this made so much perfect sense. It was like, ah, of course. Like we don't understand where the Roswell Grays come from or where that imagery come from. Psh, it's because they're Asgard. That's what's up. I liked it a lot. It, that's really, really clever for the show to do, to, to bring in these two mythologies and have them meet where you would not expect them to and present it that way. That's super fun. That's super clever. And it's something I hope the show does more of uh, as it goes on. You know, I didn't, watching this show at the beginning, I didn't expect it to do like clever reveals like that, but but I'm happy that it's doing it. It makes it more, makes it like, uh, more, uh, more, more of a layered show to watch. I thought we we're just going to be watching like, you know, uh, a baddie of the week or adventure of the week type show, and largely kind of is, but it's a lot more than that with the the mythology they're building, and it's not just mythology for mythology's sake. Like they're really playing with our history, playing with um, uh, different pop culture conventions, you know, like the Roswell Grays, things like that. Uh, the show has a lot more going on than I thought it did. So it's not as yeah. like drab as I thought it was uh, when I was watching uh, Atlantis back in the day and trying to watch this and going, this is not zippy and fun as, as Atlantis. Yeah. What, what's interesting is that, um, you know, I, I look at, you know, the kind of the, the mythology, the world building around Star Trek and, you know, the gold standard will, will always be, you know, George Lucas and kind of Star Wars and what they've done with creating these incredibly rich cultures to say, hey, instead of creating it from scratch, we're going to dive deep into existing history and culture and weave that together. I mean, it's, it's, it's low key kind of brilliant, right? Like mm -hmm. you're, you're going, it's almost rewriting history, you know, or tweaking it just a little bit to kind of fit within this world. And it, it has made it more deep and, and almost more tangible than I expected. And I'll be honest, like, especially now that we have the internet, it's of course you're going to go in and you're going to like Google Harrower and, and understand the actual like history and the mythology around it. Because I think, you know, Daniel being able to give you all of this, you know, his historical information is fascinating, but it's like only the tip of the iceberg and it starts to make you wonder, okay, well, who else is out there? Who could come up? Like it's, it's, it's low key genius, man, the way they, the way they've done this. And I think what's interesting is I'm sure I wouldn't be surprised if we have a listener who, 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 uh, who challenges this, but I'm not sure how often we've seen that before. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It does seem pretty novel. And, you know, being a sci-fi fan, sci-fi is my top genre. Um, it is fucking cool that this show says, Hey, all of the fantastical elements of, um, are the, all of the fantastical elements of, every mythology or religion that uh, exists on earth, all of that, that's all sci-fi. That's all alien stuff. You know, that's, that's really fun. I really enjoy that. Um, something I didn't enjoy about this episode, these, these Sumerian people, this is just a trend with these SG one episodes. I've seen that it's just, just so uninspiring and dull the writers do not seem to care about making a lot of these human characters that exist on these other planets interesting. Like the Sumerians, like um, Garwin, there's another big guy named Olaf. Like they're just so boring and so one note and they come off like idiots. Like when the projection of Thor as a Norse god comes up, Garwin's always like worshiping and be like, "Oh, talk to me. Why is he ignoring me?" And down of like, that, "That's that's a recording. Come on now." And you know, and then they're depicted as these these weaklings or these people that don't know how to do anything. Like, um, like when 
Daniel and Carter and Garwin are trapped and going to the trials, there's that Indiana Jones type bridge that they have to cross and Garwin just freezes immediately because she doesn't have the the will to go through it because she's just a simple peasant woman. It's like that that's so uninspiring. Like I was actually bummed that the Kendra character was killed off because she was an interesting character. She was somebody who lived on this planet who had an interesting backstory and was played by an interesting actress and was had a had had some dynamics to her. She wasn't just like uh, a one note character like like these ones are. I I hope that's not a trend that we continue to see through this show where they go and you know uh, they go to the the next forest Canadian planet and or Canadian forest planet and the locals are just a bunch of dummy. You know, I don't know if that bothers you at all. Well, you know, it's interesting because I was thinking about it as you were, as you were bringing it up. Um, it's, it's, it's tough, right? Because you're right. You, they're, they're still in this like, oh my goodness, I'm really rooted in my religion or what I understand. And you show up and it's like, oh my goodness, this is so weird. It must be magic. And, you know, we can't comprehend I don't, I'm sure it changes. It has to change because I think what we see is we see a, a pretty impressive kind of evolution and development in this, right? So if you think about, again, thinking about Stargate Atlantis and the reason, listener, if you're wondering like, man, this is a Stargate SG-1 podcast. Why does he talk about Atlantis so much? Because Atlantis is the evolution of this, Right. So to me, when you think about what you saw in Atlantis, because people love Atlantis, I think Atlantis was incredibly well done, but I think it's well done because there were a lot of lessons that they've learned while creating Stargate SG-1. And I think you see those kind of the the, the lessons learned in Stargate SG-1 implemented into Atlantis. So if you think about some of the the people that you've come in contact with in Atlantis, the two that come up to me is you immediately meet the Athosians. And to your point, Mike, when you meet the Athosians, they're not one note. They are multifaceted. They have this way, their ability to understand, even though they are quite primitive, right? And restricted in their population growth and their technology growth. But the way they communicate, and of course, with Taylor, you know, in, in particular, they, they seem very much involved. The other ones that come up is the Janai. Right. So when we meet yeah. the Janai, they are no, crazy. I mean, they are crazy, but definitely not one note. I think yeah. we're at a we're still at a point now where we're, you know, we're still developing out the SG one team and SGC. We still have yet to see very much from the SG, SGC. Like we're getting more from General Hammond, right? We got a little bit from Dr. Frazier. Like that team is gonna get some some more life. So I think we're just at the early stages. And with that comes more dynamic villagers, you know, that we meet. And if we're being honest, we saw this early on with Star Trek too, right? Like in Star Trek, they beamed down to a planet and it was like, all right, you know, I, I immediately know where this is going based on how they responded when they showed, when, when they showed up. And so I think we're, you know, safe to say it will get better. I can promise you that. Yeah. And maybe it's a side effect of Captain Powers writing this too. Who knows? <laughs> but um, one thing I did love, you mentioned the SGC and, and uh, Hammond. There's a great scene early on in this episode when they get the message from Garwin and they realize that the consequences of their actions. Like we, we broke the, the hammer and now they're going to be enslaved by the gold. We have to go help them. And Hammond's like, okay, let's think about this rationally. There's nothing really that we're going to gain from this mission. Uh, if we go, um, and there's none of our soldiers are being held captive. So is there really a reason for us to go help these people? And the entire team steps up and says, it's our fault that this is happening. And even if it wasn't, we should do it anyway. And I think it's O'Neill who's like, 
it was my idea to destroy the hammer. So I'm going to go. And then Teal'c was like, they had to destroy the hammer because of me. So I have to go. And then Jackson is like, I'm the one who literally shot and destroyed the hammer. So yeah, I got to go too. And then Carter's standing around looking at her hands like, uh, I was there too. So I got to go. It's <laughs> one of my like, favorite just, lines. Was she was there. like, I, I wasn't involved in all of that, but I was there. So count me in. She's like, these are my boys. I got to go. I got to take care of the boys. You know, I'm in, but it's good. To, to your point, Mike, I thought that was a realistic conversation, right? Mm-hmm. Like they're going, oh, we have to go. And Hammond's like, well, hold up. Like, do we? Like it was, it was a real thought. Now, again, I think what we're seeing here is we're, we're seeing, hey, you, if you want to know who SG1 is, this is who they are, right? They're the heroes. Mm-hmm. And so from a military standpoint, you ask the question of, should we go? Like, what's like, I'm risking everything to go for these people. They're not my people. We, we didn't intend to destroy it. It, it. You know, there's nothing that we can, we can't fix it. We don't have the technology to fix it. Why am I sending you to take care of them? It's a, it's a legitimate question, right? And they go, we made this mess. If it wasn't for us, they wouldn't be in the situation. Therefore, the right thing to do is to show up. This is the hero's journey. And I think this is just, it, we get to see, we get to see SG-1 go, hey, we've got to take responsibility, which I love. And Hammond go, okay, well, we've talked that out and I'm on board. Like that is the basis of who these characters are. And and that's what you kind of look and you go like, man, I love this. I love this group. I think that's where because they're at, at its heart, they're the heroes, right? They're the Avengers. They're you know they're the X Men, and you want to root for them. And that's what yeah, we saw it's true. Thing. It's true, and a, a lesser version of the show would have put them in conflict with Hammond and set up Hammond to be kind of more of a obstacle or more of a villain. But really, all all he's doing is leading. And leading in a realistic way, taking care of his people, managing his resources, and trying to find what the right thing is to do. Uh, and that was all shown to us in that scene in such a, a way that I enjoyed and respect. Like, yep, that's what a good leader in Hammond's position would do. And based on who he is from the character that's been built so far since season one, that is perfectly in line with his character. Uh, and and it gives him the opportunity, uh, well, it gives the team the opportunity to shine in that moment and to step up and say, to convince him a little bit uh, in a gratifying way. So yeah, that works really yeah. well. I, really I also think, I also think there's this tension that he has to walk, right? And to your point, you don't want to be the bad guy where he's constantly disagreeing and they go out and they do it anyway. And they save the world and he becomes the, you know, the yelling police captain, right. To the, the rebellious detectives, right. Who solve the case, but never by the book. Like you don't want that. But what you have here is you, you have this tension where it's like, okay, I don't want this to be like, Really? He just let them go? He's all on board and everybody's happy? Like, there has to be this sense of, like, realism and I am a military and I'm going to be asked, so I've got to at least, we've got to question this. You're right. He's leading and giving us this sense of 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 idealism that you've got a boss who will stand in the gap when he can and go, yes, all right, go. This may not be, you know, really the priority of the U.S., Air Force, but I understand that it's a priority for SG-1, so go for it. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Another thing the show did great was the trials that Thor put everyone through to access the chariot. At first, um, you think it's going to be just a bunch of intellectual trials and physical trials, but really what it comes down to is a uh, test of character, which uh, was a reveal as we went on and was really gratifying because it could have just been 
okay, you guys aren't advanced enough. We're going to test how advanced you are. We're going to test your intelligence, prove your worthiness. But I like the idea that the Asgard also want to make sure that the character of the person who is going to re- who is going to receive this huge gift uh, is worthy, right? And that's what we saw here. And it is a little like uh, odd that Daniel, an offworlder, is the one <laughs> who who gets to access this, and not the uh, you know a native of of the planet. Um, but I don't know. I, how do you how do you reconcile that? Or do we even have to? I think the the thing about it was, you know, I love the line where Thor says, you know, they're like, well, there's some weapons or something. He was like, no, it's, you get to meet me. Like, that was the prize. And the whole thing was where you thought it was like, oh, here's this big weapon. And I want to make sure that you are wise enough and advanced enough to use it, which is what they were expecting the real weapon was getting to meet Thor, right? Which turned out to be better than any weapon that you could have done, right? And, you know, in that, it was, it's this interesting thing because it was like, well, no, we all know you don't touch the stone. And in order to activate the stone, what you had to do was you had to be advanced enough. And if you think about it from a science standpoint, what is science ultimately? It's curiosity, right? It's how does things, how do things work? So you have to be advanced enough to move beyond the mythology of, well, you know, the tradition is that you, no one ever touches it to, I kind of need to know what happens when you do. So Test let's examine it anyway. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. Test the boundaries. And so that's what, that's the, I think some of the difference between the Sumerians and the earthlings are, is that Daniel was like, well, no, of course you, like that's it looks like a button. Let's press the button and let's see what happens. You know, and so they did. And and again, he he's thinking like, look, it looks a lot like Thor's hammer. Like we know what happens with Thor's hammers. You get t- transported somewhere else. So it's logical to think that we'll get transported somewhere else. And worst case scenario, we'll have to find our way out. And hopefully there's not an Unos in there. <laughs> but <laughs> right. And so so I look at that and I'm like, oh, I see it. It's you know, one of the things that I always see about or I think about in these kind of primitive societies that are left on the planet is that it's they're looking for them to evolve without any interference. Mm-hmm. And I look at the Sumerians as a perfect example of would they have ever gotten there? I don't think the way they're depicted, I don't know. I don't know that they would have. Yeah, they kind of just believed what they were, be- what they believed, and and I think you, I, I think that's very similar with Abydos too. Like the, in mm-hmm. truth, it feels like, especially because they're constantly being attacked by the Gould, and even in Samaria, in, in Samaria, where there is a safe world, it's like with the threat of the Gould, you feel like you're protected, and therefore you don't have to fight for advance, right? You know. Um, Innovation, invention, the uh, necessity is the uh, mother of invention, right? Yeah. Meaning that you, you, you have to need something in order to innovate and create. I, I think with some of the worlds that we've been introduced, there hasn't been this, this dire need, and they've kind of been stagnant a little bit. Yeah, that makes sense. It also makes sense from a story perspective that, you know, our point of view characters, our, our team that we root for are sg1 they are the humans and so mm, it kind of feels like we keep meeting these key alien races um throughout this show and it almost feels like humanity is trying to tell its story to these other races to prove themselves worthy of being like part of this galactic council that has a certain power or something i don't know we'll get there maybe um so yeah, this is pretty good. It was it was probably like uh, a little better than most of the uh, mission of the week episodes, especially since it gave us so much mythology and it and it cycled back to a previous episode and and gave us more story and, and more life to that that part of the the universe. That was cool. Um, Gate World tells us to move on to episode eight next. Family. Uh, let me read the synopsis. 
Oh, the the kid's back. Okay, SG-1 attempt to rescue Teal'c's son, who has been kidnapped and brainwashed by Apothis. Teal'c learns disturbing news about his wife. Oh, did they kill her? Maybe. All right. Um, should we watch the one before that, episode seven? Do you want me to find what that is? I'm looking at the synopsis now. Um, episode seven is Message in a Bottle. Okay. Um, it, it, SG-1 brings back a mysterious fear from P5C353. The sphere suddenly sprouts rods that impale O'Neill, pinning him to the wall. I remember this one. After attempts to remove it, they discover it's microscopic aliens that feed on energy who are the last of an alien race. Huh. Right? Um, I won't read the last part. Um, I don't know that that's a must-have. I think it's going to have some flashbacks in it, maybe. Mm. Um, this one, family makes sense. We can read family. It's also a Catherine Powers. Is it? It is. It is. And William Gary, directed by, mm-hmm. who did uh, who did the episode we just talked about. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, yeah. Well, let's watch Family, then. Okay. Family for the next episode. Uh, episode eight of season two. Uh, yeah. I this, this, this one sounds cool. Like, I guess Apophis is still alive. He's around. And then Tilk's son is close to him now, which is interesting. So maybe maybe we'll see Braytac come back. Maybe not. Yes. Guest stars. Tommy, Tony Amendola, Braytac. All right. Let's do we yeah. gotta see Braytac. Yeah. We gotta do it. Yeah, some of All my right. favorite ones are the Martin Wood ones who directs yeah. Peter DeLuise. Those are some of my favorite. Yeah. Brad Wright. Oh, yep, Brad Wright. Oh, absolutely. If B- Brad Wright and Jonathan Glasner. When mm-hmm. when they're when they're involved, um, I'm like, okay, something special is gonna happen. All right. Anything else to say about uh, where we're at in season two of SG One? No, it's good. We've so if, it, just to kind of catch you up, we've been introduced with, to a few new characters. We've got the Tokra, we've got the Asgard, we've got a a new system lord and her her er. Um, yeah, like uh, the world is expanding. Um, it's exciting to kind of see what happens next. Yeah, and the, it, and it's exciting that Braytac's going to be in the next episode. So you know we love Braytac. He's one of my favorites. All right, Clyde. Uh, let people know where they can find you. Well, you can find me at Clyde Haynes, and you can also find me uh, on uh, the Star Trek Discovery Pod uh, on Thursdays, where we talk about all things Star Trek. Um, that's usually where I'm hanging out. You can find me on Insta and Threads at Mike Moody Garcia. Follow the pod on Insta and Threads at Intergalactic Pod. And subscribe to the pod everywhere. All those links are at intergalacticpod.co. Thanks for listening. <laughs>